Hello, everyone. Greetings to the brethren and to all. So, this is part two of my sermon on the rapture, the purposes of the rapture and eternal life. Uh, so, as always, please take this back to the Holy Spirit uh, and check the scriptures uh, so that you may understand it better. I don't claim to understand all of this stuff whatsoever. I'm just going forward and trying to do the best I can with it because I believe there really is not a lot of time left. So we're talking about the rapture and what are what's the purpose of the rapture? Uh, in the last uh, part of the sermon, I mentioned uh, some of the things which I view as the purpose, uh, but now I want to get down to the, the meat of the story, so to speak, uh, and ask the question, a fascinating question, just what is eternal life? Now, I would like to start by reading from, this is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, uh, and this is verse, I'm going to start with verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So guys, this is just my present understanding, but so the moment the rapture occurs, something so important is happening. As we know, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those who are still living rise and they don't just get uh, evacuated from the seven-year tribulation or uh, rewarded, uh, although I do believe it is those things. They, we, receive a glorified body, also known as a celestial body. Um, and I'd like to hear read a, a couple more verses, because here I'm going to read from John 4.14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And then if we go to uh, Romans 8.18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared which, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So what is this eternal life? What is this water of eternal life which Jesus Christ alone can give? Um, and I'll read one more scripture quote. This is Revelation uh, 21 verses 3 and 4. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. 
and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So, what is eternal life? Now, we know that the soul is already immortal. The immortal soul cannot die. So, eternal life can't just be eternal existence because whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, we already have eternal existence, but we don't all have eternal life because the only ones who have eternal life are those who accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, who believe the gospel that Jesus was God and yet he came to earth in the flesh with a mortal body just like you or me. And then he was crucified upon a cross, and he was dead for three days. But after that, he was resurrected. And then something happened to him. He got a glorified or a celestial body. And so this, he, this shows uh, me the simple fact that we don't all have eternal life. Only Jesus could give that. And we receive that through faith or belief in the gospel. Uh, and those who do not believe the gospel receive eternal death or eternal destruction. Because this state that we're in now, what we see as our human life within time, it is going to pass into an eternal state, an unending state. And it's one way or the other. I don't believe in purgatory or anything like that. It's you're going up or you're going down. Uh, and we see that hell is very real. Everlasting destruction, eternal death, everlasting shame or contempt. Uh, and if, if you've seen any of the testimonials of people such as Brian Melvin or Randy Kay, man, those people who even just seen hell Wow, you could get traumatized just by seeing it, you know, and if you've seen the testimonials of heaven, well, it's that's a whole other story. Uh, and <clears throat> so we know that eternal life has to be much more than just continued existence, because we already have that, and that doesn't go away. Um, so here, I've read some of the scripture, and I would like to share uh, a spiritual experience, which I had quite a few years ago which I never really understood. Now, it was a very powerful experience. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of my life when I experienced it or what happened before, because I don't really think that that's relevant uh, or important. Um, but all I know, all I know about this experience was it affected me very greatly. Um, it was something I never forgot. Uh, it was very, it was the kind of thing that you could never forget after having uh, experienced it. And I always wondered what it was and what it meant. And I tried to understand it within other spiritual systems and I, it never quite made sense. Uh, and I talked to other people within other spiritual systems and they hadn't experienced anything like that. And I, but I always wondered about it. I just couldn't forget it because it was so vivid and so intense and of course, I could be totally wrong in this. I don't know. But as I look back, um, after having now been reborn through Christ Jesus for several months now, and I look back at that powerful experience that I had, I can't help but think, you know, the perfect description of that experience would be to call it eternal life. Uh, and so I'll share the experience with you guys, uh, really just concentrating on what I what I felt during that experience. Uh, because I, I personally believe that, that the things that we go through in this life are all part of the Lord's plan. Uh, we may not understand them while we're going through them. I, in fact, I think a lot of the time we don't. But I know that ultimately the things that happen to us are not an accident because God the Father is up there with Jesus Christ upon the throne and is directing everything. And, you know, I had this experience that was just so powerful 
Uh, and, you know, before you are reborn in, in Christ Jesus and you begin to study the scripture, you just have to say this. You really can't understand anything on a spiritual level. Uh, through the lens of any demon doctrine, which is anything other than um, the gospel, the scripture, you just are blind. You're spiritually blind. Uh, and you can have different powerful experiences, but you can't comprehend them. Or uh, That was the state that I was in until recently when I was reborn. And now looking back at that experience that I had and this incredible feeling that I experienced that I never could understand, I never could produce it again with my own efforts. All I could tell about it was that it was just something that had come over me suddenly and there had to be something divine about it. It had to be some force or power that just had me experience that. And I believe, this is just my own understanding, that it was something that God was showing me at the time that I couldn't comprehend at the time, but he stuck it in my memory. He had me experience that. And now that I've been reborn through Christ Jesus, I look at it with the lens of the scripture. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe that was like a preview of the feeling of entering the glorified body. Now, look at me now. I don't have a glorified body, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, and none of us do. But I believe that at, at the moment uh, of the rapture, we will be raised along with the dead and we will receive those glorified bodies. Um, and it's clearly such an important moment of the rapture because the dead in Christ, those who since the time of Christ have, have laid in death, their bodies will rise first and with us will be joined and we will receive these glorified bodies like our Lord Jesus Christ received after he was resurrected. Um, and so I now want to mention some of the things that I felt during that experience. So... When that experience came upon me many years ago with great force, um, the first thing that I felt about it was I thought, wow, you could experience this for like a trillion years and you would never get bored of it. It was like a feeling, which have you guys ever thought this? Have you ever thought, you know, wouldn't you get bored in heaven? I mean, if it goes on for eternity, no matter how much stuff there is to do, wouldn't you just eventually get bored of it or something? It's a perfectly reasonable thing to think because from our perspective, whatever we do on this earth, you know, it gets boring. You can seek after all kinds of pleasures on this earth, but they never quite satisfy you. You always need more and no matter how much you get of pleasures of the flesh, you get desensitized to it, right? But man, when I felt this experience, the first thing I felt was you could be in this state for like a million years and it it, you, you would never get bored of it. It was like a con constant refreshing. And now when I think back to, uh, to the scripture, when I, th when I think to this, the, the river of life, all I can say is, I think that that's what eternal life is. More than just continued existence. We have that, our souls are immortal. But what this experience made me realize was that, that the, well, you know what? I'm going to keep reading about what I wrote uh, about the experience, and then I'll, I'll see if I can put it into words, because this stuff is it's really hard to put into words. But yeah, the first thing that I felt was that it was like a feeling that you would never get bored of this feeling. It could go on for a trillion years, and you would just feel it's like as if time's not passing it. And the next thing I wrote was it's a, it was like a feeling of pure innocence. It was like a feeling like as if you were just completely innocent. And now I think back, I'm like, yes, because Jesus's blood washes us clean of all of our sins. And I think that in our current bodies, we can't fully feel that because the sins are embedded in the flesh. We know that we're forgiven. We know that. And yet we still feel guilt. We still feel shame. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing that we feel guilt and shame. I think it's, it's good to feel those in our flesh but I think in that moment, when we get that glorified body, man, then we fully feel that presence of Jesus Christ putting on, putting the incorruptible upon this corruption. And that was the other thing I felt when I had this experience was like a feeling of complete innocence, like a feeling of just almost like being a, a tiny child that just has no guilt or shame, a complete feeling. The other thing I felt was it was as if time just ceased to exist. It was like, 
it, it, it was like the weight of time was just gone. It was like being outside of time, which again, when we get that glorified body, we are in heaven, man. It's called eternal for a reason. Uh, the, the next thing about it was, it was not a feeling of power whatsoever. I did not feel powerful. There was not this power in it. It was more like a complete surrender or a complete giving up to some, you, you might think that if you felt this, you would feel like powerful, like as if you are God or something. It wasn't, it was like the opposite of that. It was like a complete being like a child is completely innocent. Um, it was perfectly peaceful. There was no, the, the best way I can describe this feeling was like how I wrote it here. I wrote this feeling is, was utterly alien, utterly different than the feeling of joy, which the flesh experiences from fulfilling its desires. This feeling was not a magnification of flesh satisfaction. It was utterly distinct of a different nature, and no worldly thing can even be compared to it. Um, that was the, the next thing I felt. It was like this complete innocence. It was totally peaceful. There was no agitation in it. There was no rushing feeling. Like any pleasure of the earth is based on like dopamine or something. There's like this rush, like this motion. This feeling was like totally peaceful and still. And there was no, no, no sense like anything had to be added to it. It was like just a, a vivid peacefulness. Um, and it was so unlike any fleshly, anything that's produced by a fleshly high, whether it's like sex or drugs or anything else. But that's what I mean by saying it was like alien. Because I you couldn't say like, oh, it was like, having a million orgasms or, oh, it was like doing every drug at once. It's like, it wasn't, the character of this was completely different. It was as if like, you thought you knew joy, man, I felt that feeling. And it was like, nope, <laughs> the thing you thought was joy was like, not even on the scale. It wasn't even like multiply any pleasure on earth times a trillion. Nope. It had what I would say was like a totally different character. And it was just... You know, it, I, I don't know. It's, I'm struggling to put it into words, but all I can think is, you know, that experience always stayed with me and I never could comprehend it really. But now that I read the scripture and I look back onto it, you know, it, it really was like a, it, 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 that experience, as much as I don't understand it, it's, it helps me understand the scripture when I look at it and you see that all the, the pleasure of the flesh is like opposed to the pleasure of the spirit the pleasure or whatever you want to call it, the joy of the spirit is not at all like the joy of the flesh. There's something fundamentally corrupt or broken. Even the greatest joy of the flesh that comes from the world is like nothing compared to the real joy of the spirit. This, what I'm calling this everlasting life. Uh, it, and for anyone who believes that it's something that's like inherently just in us that we all have, it's our own self. What I would say is like, no way. This is, it was clearly something that some sort of force, what I now would say is God, the father, Jesus Christ somehow showed me. And I later attempted to like regain it or do this or that. I never could experience it again. No drug ever produced it. I tried doing meditation techniques and like whatever this was, it was just very separate from that. It came upon me. I'm not going to go into the details of my life then. But all I can say is that, you know, when I read the scripture, I believe that these words are far more than what, what may seem in the sense that, oh, everlasting life, it just means we exist forever. There's something way more powerful here, so vivid. I mean, if you think of how torturous hell is, man, heaven is like, what I now understand that this feeling was is it's everlasting life or it's like the proximity to God. Because this is not something that's just in us. It's like being close to God in a way that we we really can experience in these fleshly bodies that have in them this uh, original sin, this inclination towards sin, this hunger that never goes away. Um, 
oh, I wish I had the quote about the, the lamb will feed them. Uh, it's like it, it's like it all comes from Jesus. It's like this, that thing I felt, it's like, that's like Jesus. Like, it's not something in me. It's not something in any of us inherently. We have to accept the gift of salvation. And I think we we can't really feel it. I don't have a glorified body now, but I think that that feeling was like a preview of it or was like a sense of it because I think God, well, I'll say this. I know God knew that later I would be reborn. My name had been written in the book of life, even though I didn't know it then. And then when I was reborn in October, I started reading the scripture. Man, I look back at that experience now and I think God may have placed that experience in my past so that when I look at it with the I was going to hold up the Bible and say the lens of the scripture. Now I'm like, man, this eternal life stuff is no joke. Uh, and I think it's very important to talk, preach the message of hell, the eternal destruction, that it is torture, it is agony. But the other side of the coin, this eternal life is like a feeling unlike anything upon the earth. No drugs, nothing else can compare to it. This is a feeling like just... You know, a lot of people say, like, how could a just God sentence us to eternal, you know, destruction in hell? Well, that's just not fair. And I would say that you could say this feeling I felt, which I personally believe, I could be wrong, just expressing my own thoughts, that I believe that's the feeling of eternal life, man. You could say, how could we deserve that? <laughs> that was just, it was so unlike anything in the world. It was so, you know, wow. And I believe that that is what we will feel in that moment when we are called up and our bodies put on the incorruptible and the mortal puts on the immortality. It's a lot more than just, hey, now you know you're alive forever. Oh, no, it, it is like a vivid refreshing. It is like, it's like all the pain that you ever felt it's like annihilated by it. I don't know how to put it into words, but that's like what I felt when I had that experience. All the pain we've ever felt, it's like stored up in our body. All the, the, the shame, the seeking things, the never stillness. It's like, man, when you really touch that eternal life and we really have it already, like we believe it. We, it's like we're destined towards it. But when we give up these mortal bodies and we are fully in the spirit and you feel that, man, it's like, Whatever we have gone through in this life, all the agony, it's like that somehow just wipes it away. And it makes sense because it wipes out this sin nature of our body. And man, all I would say is however long we have to go before the rapture or whatever happens, the nature of God, of Jesus Christ is so powerful that when when we when Jesus calls us up and, and we are there, man, all I can say is, you know, we're not going to be thinking back on the pain we had or, oh man, it, we're not just going to say it was worth it. We are going to say, Lord, we are not worthy. This, that what Jesus has given us is more than worth it. And simply by believing on Jesus, that is already locked in. That is our destination. Okay. So I think that's the best I can put that into words. I hope uh, that that helps, but all I can say is that was something I experienced. It stayed with me, and it was just unlike anything else, and I hope it may be uh, useful to everyone. So I'll go on to the next point now. Oh, so I wrote, the timing of the rapture uh, is perfect, and we are wise to trust this and be patient. Uh, you know, it's, we know that God has perfect timing. He knows just when to do the rapture. I don't believe anything is going to speed it up or slow it down. At just the right moment, boom, it will it will kick in. And so I think we should definitely watch. We should look. I'm seeing that this is soon, man. That's one reason why I'm like sharing this experience now that I just shared, because I think I may not have time. If I wait three years trying to study and put it into words better, I'm not going to have time. So that's why now I, one reason why I make these videos, I go forward is I know I haven't had time to go to Bible school or integrate everything, but I'm thinking, man, you know, it could be any moment. I better do what I can now, try to use the experiences I had, try to express something because this uh, rapture could take place at any moment. Uh, but what I do know is that when it takes place, that is exactly when God wants it to. And I think we should trust that uh, and uh, just endure, just be patient because it is going to hit and it's going to catch us all by surprise to some extent, you know, because none of us know exactly the moment when it's going to hit. But like, I think we keep looking up 
and it will hit at just the right time. Okay, so, oh, uh, a quick note on having a perfect uh, heart before the Lord. I've been watching some interesting videos uh, about that. Um, and what I wrote here uh, is I saw something in one of the videos. I, I can't remember which one it was, but I really liked what they said. They said it, it means having no part of your heart hidden from the Lord. Um, this is funny because really none of us have any part of our heart hidden from the Lord. But a lot of us act like we do or act like we can hide a part. Um, and this is just my understanding. But, you know, having a perfect heart before the Lord, it really doesn't mean that doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean our behavior is perfect. Doesn't mean all our thoughts are perfect. No way, because we know that that would only describe Jesus. But we see in the Bible, various people have a perfect heart before the Lord. Uh, and I really agreed with, with this video I saw that it's like, you just keep showing you, we, it's like living every day with the knowledge that God sees every part of you, that nothing can be hidden from him. And I almost think of it like saying over and over, oh, Lord, take my heart, even when my heart has wickedness, even when my own heart deceives me, even when I'm confused, I just keep saying, oh, Lord, I offer you my heart. Lord, see everything in me. Lord, what should I do? Uh, and I believe that having a perfect heart is really something you can achieve, and it's not about reaching some standard of perfection. I believe it's more like just giving all of yourself over to the Lord, uh, just accepting the fact that he sees every thought, everything, and just continually thinking, speaking, living in a way that you know it's as if he's standing right next to you. Um, and so I'll, I just wanted to mention that. That's my current understanding of what having a perfect heart before the Lord means. Um, uh, next, well, this is a disclaimer that I said in the earlier sermon, but I'll say it again here. So the Holy Spirit is so important. I don't have any special understanding. I am learning more each day and doing my best to express it. Please do not put your faith in me or my understanding, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. His Holy Spirit can help clarify the things that I say and the scripture. Uh, the grace of the Lord is so important. This is a kind of a separate topic, but I'm just going to go through, go through it. Um, man, I see every day how grace is so essential. Here I wrote... Uh, our choices are important, and we must make choices. Um, but the beauty, the radiance, the fact that anything works out at all really comes from the grace of the Lord Jesus. We do our little part and take our little steps, but the Lord completes the journey. He's, he's already completed. He's finished the work on the cross. Here I'm just talking about when we're doing anything in life, when any, any mission we have, anything that we just turn towards the Lord and we... We do it. We want to do the best. Oh, we make we take our little steps, but it's really his grace that gets it done the rest of the way. Um, and I've seen this so much that it's it's really like as if we take a few little steps, the best we can do, and he kind of does the rest because he alone can do these great things. He alone has this power. We really don't have power. Our choices matter, but I see over and over again that really what I've contributed, just to use my own my own life as an example, since I've been reborn, it's really very little. If I look at what I did, it's like really not much. You know, I made, I made a WhatsApp group or I, you know, I started to make videos and put them on YouTube. But if you look at what I did, it's really just a tiny piece, but he really does the much greater part. Uh, and so I, you know, for me, the grace of the Lord is so important. I just see that constantly. Our choices matter. We make the best choices we can, but for me, this really doesn't come down to me making the perfect choices or understanding everything or doing most of the work. I continually have a feeling like, like I just make a few little choices. I mess things up a lot. I just try, but I just keep, I keep crying out to the Lord and I keep knowing that, well, the Lord is there. He's seeing me and I keep wanting to please him. Um, and I feel like he that does really does the work. Uh, he really puts, puts in the things that make it beautiful. Uh, and I trust the Lord and I, I know how great our Lord is. Uh, and so I wanted to say that. Um, now I will say that I am gradually learning that the suffering I went through in my life and still go through sometimes has and had a deeper purpose and meaning, which I am only now beginning to understand to a tiny degree after reading the scripture and being reborn last October. No matter how wise or intelligent or experienced you are, 
You really can't understand anything on a spiritual level until you are reborn after hearing and accepting the gospel. Once that happens, the true spiritual learning begins. The scripture is the outer guide and the Holy Spirit is the inner guide. The learning process is different for everyone. The Lord knows you so intimately. He uses everything to teach. Guys, this is so true. What I've been so amazed by about this whole process is how, guys, the Lord is the master teacher because he uses your whole life to teach you. As I said, the Holy Spirit's so important. The scripture is like the outer God, but the Lord uses all your experiences. Uh, he uses uh, intuitions you have. He guides your attention to things. He uses things from your past. See, now I'm looking back at my past powerful spiritual experience I had that I always tried to understand. And now I'm like, man, I bet you that is like a preview of the eternal life because that's that makes sense. That's causing me to understand more about what is this eternal life? What are these fountains of living waters? You know, I'm, now I'm, I'm looking back at a lot of other past experiences, you know, all those moments when I really wanted to kill myself, I couldn't. Uh, it's like, ah, that's like men will run from death, but death will f flee from them. You know, you can't commit suicide. That's agony. I'm looking at all kinds of things and I'm understanding it more through the Holy Spirit and through what I'm learning from the scripture. And that's what's so amazing about the Lord is he teaches you with everything. He knows just how to teach you. You know, he might send you a word or you see a word on YouTube and it's like he knows just what to say for where you're at. He knows where you're at so intimately that he will just use everything. And at times it's very clear. Other times it's not so clear. And he, he wants you to think about that. You know, what I've seen again and again with the Lord is he doesn't want me to be in some kind of zombified state. You know, a lot of other um, spiritual systems, doctrines of demons, you know, they believe that we can reach enlightenment or we're like a zombie sitting there in nirvana. And the Lord has showed me that is not it at all. Oh, that was the other thing. I should mention that. When I had, I'll call it the eternal life experience, I was not in a zombified state. I, I moved around. I, it was like a fully, it was not at all like some zombie state or something. It was like, I see it that when we're in heaven with those celestial bodies, it's not like sitting in some pleasure trance. It's like you're moving around, you're active, you're there. It's just all the pain of the flesh is like gone so much that we just always experience. There's always this like grain of irritation. This is always some boredom. Whatever you get, it's never enough. There's always this weird feeling of shame or guilt or lust of us in some kind. And I believe that experience I had is like a preview of like in heaven, that's gone. But to a degree, you, you can't comprehend. It's like it is wiped away and it's like eternal innocence, eternal vividness and it is just all i can say is the very fact that we gain that we get destined towards that the moment that we are reborn and have faith in jesus christ i mean the free gift of salvation salvation isn't just that we don't go to hell it's not like oh we don't go to hell but we just stay on the earth so I mean, no 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 not only do we not go to hell we go towards that state that we can't fully taste now you know, we experience the fruits of the spirit. Now we get more peaceful. We feel, we feel a taste of that spiritual joy. But I believe that when we get these glorified bodies and we go into heaven, man, that's when you see the full grace of the Lord, because salvation isn't just don't go to hell. It's we enter heaven. And that is like, just makes this earth look like nothing. The joys of this earth are like, yes, it's just nothing. And all the pain that we take for granted the, the, the pain that's just always there on some level, you almost don't notice it, of this flesh, of its hunger, of its memories of pain that's just kind of embedded there, maybe to a greater or lesser degree, depending on what you've lived and so on. Man, that is just wiped out. And it is like, you know, heaven is makes this look like nothing. <laughs> it's just a fully active state where you can think, you can learn, you can experience things. But like, man, we do not even comprehend how much this flesh, it's like it's evil, okay? It's its like its the pain is within it. It's not something that's just always there everywhere. It's like this flesh is opposed to the spirit. And when this flesh can only be conquered by Christ Jesus, he already died upon the cross and that did it. That's like done. 
We have to believe that, though, to accept the free gift of salvation. He didn't just automatically give salvation to everyone. No, 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 no. He it, he gave it to those who accept it and just essentially acknowledge that that's reality that happened and fully believe it, which is way more than just an intellectual knowing of it. It should make your whole life change. You should get reborn, as I did, you know. But that moment when we get the glorified bodies, as the scripture says, that's when it's like death, where is your string, your sting? That is the taste of eternal life. And it's like, man, that is just, that experience I had, dude, it never left me. I never stopped trying to understand what it was because it was so vivid. It was just like, it made everything else in my life just seem like nothing. I couldn't even talk about it for like a year because I was like, how do you even speak about this thing? And I went through different attempts to understand it on spiritual levels. I never really got it. And But now looking at the scripture, like that's eternal life, man, or it's, it's a preview of it. I obviously don't have a glorified body now, but all I can say is, man, the, the pains of this life is like, in a way, it's even more than we realize, like that full lightness of being in the spirit of being in heaven. And it really all comes from a person. That's what's so strange about it. It's not something that we all have or some collective thing of humanity. No, it comes from like one person that that is like their nature. And that person is God, who is Jesus Christ. This is stuff that you can like say it and like you can't understand it intellectually. But when you're reborn, you start to grasp this. The Holy Spirit's showing me like that's the feeling of God. But that's not something a lot of people say, oh, but God's in all of us. Or like we all are gods or this evil concept of gnosis, of the secret knowledge that we're all gods, that you can use your mind to attract things, or you just have to remember that you're a god and then you'll be in some bliss state. Like, dude, all that is designed to do is pull you into hell. Because as you're seeking after that, you miss the fact that, no, we're not all gods. We never will be. We are not God. There is no trick we can do to enter into an effortless state of bliss for eternity. It doesn't even really make sense. Right. And you have all these people sitting in caves and I did it too. I didn't literally sit in the cave, but I, I chased after that state of just meditating and experienced different things. And like, all I can say is like that is that stuff is not only wrong. That stuff has one goal in mind to pull you into hell because people are going to go after their bliss state and wait to get reincarnated. And ex you can experience things by doing different meditating or doing some mantra or whatever. And it's, it's like, it's all it's designed to do is at the moment you die, and, oh, I'll be reincarnated. I'll enter the whatever lotus chakra or something. It's like, and believe me, I was into that stuff too. No, you're going to die. And then you're going to suddenly, the angel of death is going to overpower you, pull you into hell. And it's like, now you are in an eternal state that's anything but nirvana. And praise the Lord Jesus Christ that I realized this before I died. And through grace and faith, I was able to accept the gift of eternal life which just comes from uh, grace. It wasn't like I did anything to deserve it, dude. I was pulling people into demon doctrines left and right. I had no idea. I didn't know it was a demon doctrine. Uh, and I know that I can't fully feel that now at all, what that's like, man. You could also describe the eternal life. It's like being in the presence of Jesus in his full glorified form that you yourself can only experience when you're in a glorified body. That's just the best way I'm putting it into words. But all I can say is like, it's not just about the punishment aspect of, hey, hell is a state of eternal torture. That's what it is, right? But this other side of it is like, wow, you could see why in heaven you would just be near God, just worship him constantly because this gift that he gives you, which doesn't come from our works. It's not like you can earn eternal life. It's like, no, it is so far beyond anything you could ever merit or deserve or earn from any amount of works. And it's literally given to you for free just for believing on Jesus. And we can't fully feel it. You get reborn as I've been going through, but that little preview I had of that feeling, whatever you want to call it, was just like when we taste this and this happens, and it will, when the rapture, when the trumpet sounds, when the dead, because the dead have to be rise first, when it comes together in that moment, that, and that's just my view, that's like God saying, behold, my greatness. Boom! And then he just gives you this thing and we're just like, huh, whatever. One thing we're not going to be doing up there is complaining about anything we went through in life. Like, however bad it may have been, however bad it may even still be for you, man, you taste that thing. It's like death, where's thy sting? It's not just like, oh, okay, cool. I get to live forever. It's like, no, the pain of the flesh is wiped away 
the hunger of the flesh, the shame of the flesh, the memory is like it's wiped away and you taste that feeling, which is the feeling of God. And it's just like, dude, you could be there for a trillion years, just worship, honor, power, glory, thanksgiving to the Lord, because that is how great God is. And all these people who believe that you can meditate and reach it, or some guru will give it to you, or some new age thing. It's like, no, man, no, 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 no. Like that, it's very sad that they believe that because they're going to awaken to eternal destruction and torment. This is something that only the grace of God can give, and God has made it very clear how to get it. You just have to accept the fact that God already sacrificed his son, Jesus Christ, upon a cross. You just have to believe it. That's all there is. Just believe the gospel. But there's this whole menu of all these appealing things that it's just watching some video about these celebrities like, I do the law of attraction. I can speak things into existence. You have to, it's just like, dude, she's got to, God's got to just be like laughing at that. Like, really? So you can say like, let there be light. And they'll just really like try it. I'd love to like talk to one of those people be like, you can speak things into existence. All right, ready? Like speak an apple into existence in my hand. All right, come on, just do it. Let's see. All right, I'm waiting. Where is it? You know, like how do people believe that stuff? Like they're just, they are headed for eternal destruction. And you know, we should pray for them. We should try to bring the gospel, but that stuff is just taking over the world. It's like God has given, you know, he's given the one way to eternal life, belief on Jesus. And then the devil has put all these other options on the menu and it's all like looking like, what are you going to pick? You have, you only have so much time. This state will run out and it will pass into eternal destruction, which is like being tortured for eternity or into this eternal life, which is more than just ongoing existence. It's more than just sitting there. It's what I saw from the taste of that experience was, it is, you couldn't even imagine that. It is something so much greater than you can even imagine. It was like, and I, I probably just received a fraction of it or something, but whatever it was, it never left. I never found anyone else who had had that experience. I never understood why. I could never figure it out. And now what I believe it was, was like a taste of that because it was, it was so, so different than anything you felt. It's so clean. It's so pure. It's like, it wasn't based on any kind of effort. It's like, look, I don't fully understand it whatsoever. I'm just sharing the experience with you guys because I believe that that is what we will be established in when when we are raised, the dead are raised, and we all get, get hit with that and we are in that. And that's how, if you take one thing away from this, man, you're not going to get poured in heaven. That closeness of the Lord, when he gives us that river of life that we can drink from freely Man, it is like a constant refreshing. It's like a like an eternal youth. It's like a pure now lightness, like no guilt. It's like a there's. It's not this powerful feeling. It's like this light innocence. It's like, man, I see how you would just worship, just worship. So anyway, that's just the best I understand it, guys. I'll, I will move along again. Um, oh, so check this out. So. Yeah, the Lord teaches you with everything, man. I believe he was teaching me with that past experience. I didn't even know it. Dude, I spent years trying to figure it out, trying to reproduce it. Could never figure it out. It never really made sense. All other spiritual people tried to weigh in. It was just like, what was that? And now, man, it's like as if the Lord is using memory of that to teach me, give me a hint about this. And uh, yeah, uh, so the Lord uses everything to teach you. Stuff in your past, the Holy Spirit can show you about it, right? Stuff that's happening, it's like, man. When you just really give your heart over to the Lord, when you are just focused on the Lord, when your deepest desire is, I want to please my Lord and Savior, I want to make him happy because he is what makes me happy. And you're enough of this world. I have had enough of this world. I don't want the pleasures of this world. I don't want to be stuck in these loops. This world is a misery. It's a ruin. It's nothing. When you have that and you just come before the Lord in each and every moment, oh man, the Lord just starts teaching you with everything. I never would have even believed it, I, that you could, I could have learned things at this rate, man. It's just, it's amazing. And I got to give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ for this, because this has been the adventure of a lifetime. And I feel like it's only just begun. And I always have a feeling like I don't deserve it, but not in a bad way. It really is that great that I, we really don't deserve it. It's like, it's grace. We don't deserve it at all. Um, and so here I wrote, um, a childlike attitude of faith in the Lord, humility, 
a willingness to overturn previous understanding whenever necessary, and a strong desire to please the Lord and make him happy instead of making yourself happy seems to help a lot. Any seeming spiritual wisdom or understanding which is not based on rebirth in Christ Jesus and the scripture is actually a sinking deeper into the net of deception of Satan as one heads towards hell without being aware of it. Oh man, you really have to just pity people who are wise or who think they have spiritual knowledge, but it does not come from Jesus Christ because they look, we're all deceived. We all are. Uh, but man, it's just, you see the pride that comes from thinking you have this spiritual wisdom from the other spiritual systems. And it's like, I look at that and I'm like, man, the net of deception is so tight. It's so tight. Uh, I thought I had spiritual understanding. I thought I had some kind of wisdom. I had devoted a lot of my life to doing spiritual practices, reading other scriptures. I was really into it, but now I see I didn't know anything. And it's it's not quite true to say I didn't know anything because there is a lot of truth in those other spiritual systems about God, about life and stuff. And that's how Satan hooks you with it. But the key piece is Jesus Christ. And Satan offers you all this truth and you experience it in different ways. And, you know, you can learn about how God is love. And it's like, that's how he gets you, but he hides Jesus. And then it becomes like a net that pulls you into hell. And you don't even realize until the moment you die and your soul leaves your body. And it's like too late. Uh, and so, man, all I can say is praise the Lord that I was, I woke up, uh, through believing on Jesus uh, and thank the Lord that that happened because guys, this it's like, okay, oh, I'll keep reading it. Um, cause I want to get to another point. So yeah, if, if anyone thinks that they have wisdom or spiritual knowledge or understanding, like a lot of the stuff they know or understand is like, that's why it seems like wisdom. There's a lot of profound stuff in it, but the key element that stops you from going into eternal hell is hidden. Jesus Christ is hidden. It's the only way you can escape hell. People say hell is a state of mind or, or hell is blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, hell's a place and you'll be there for eternity. And people seem to think hell only would affect you if you believe in it. It's like, no, 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 no. That couldn't be further from the truth. No, 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 no. Heaven and hell are not states of mind. They're not something that only applies to those who believe in them. No, 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 no. That's, I, I cannot emphasize enough that that is not true, but so many are deluded by that. All these people who think that our minds have the ability to create things or we can speak things into existence or, man, you're going to be in hell for eternity trying to believe anything you want and you will not never get out because that is how powerful the God who judges is the one and only creator of the universe whose name is Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if you decide not to believe in him. It's like you can't, you can't negate Jesus by just not believing in him or by thinking Christians are crazy or something. But what's really sad is those people, the price they are going to pay for not believing on Jesus is, and this is the next point that I wanted to get to. Um, uh, yes. So for me, okay. So I'll just keep reading. It. Okay. So people are being sucked uh, towards hell in this net of deception. If they think they have any spiritual wisdom or understanding, which is not based on rebirth in Jesus and the scriptures. I wrote, this is the strong delusion which the Lord sends for those without a love for the truth. The very existence of hell, as described in the scripture, is extremely strong evidence that the scripture is not the work of human beings, but of a supreme spiritual authority who never needs to justify himself to humans. Quite the contrary, we need to justify ourselves to him. And he has already done all the work needed for this upon the cross. We must choose to believe this with faith. Choosing not to believe this has an eternal consequence. This shows how important belief and faith are to the supreme sovereign creator and ruler of the universe, God, whose name is Jesus Christ. So I'll just keep going with this a little bit. Fascinating thing to see is like, to me, this is such a strong argument 
that the Bible is not the work of human beings. Because if you stop and think about it, if human beings are going to create any spiritual system, any interpretation of reality, right? Anyone who creates like a spiritual system or interpretation of reality has to like have some kind of like punishment or some corrective mechanism, right? Every spiritual system has some way that if you do bad, you get punished. Or nowadays, it's all this mentalist idea, like we're all in our own dream and you have to adjust your dream. But every spiritual system has to have some explanation for things going wrong. Now they say like, oh, you're, you have to clean your dream or just put your attention on the positive or whatever. But like... Think for a second what the Bible really says, that the punishment is a state of unending eternal torture. Like, what human would possibly create that? Because on a human level, how could it ever make sense from our perspective that something that we do, like limited within time, would merit a punishment which is eternal, right? It makes sense that humans would say, oh, you go to purgatory and then you get better or you learn spiritual lessons. But God says you are eternally tortured, unending. Like try to comprehend that. If I said that like, you know, you murdered six people and your punishment is to be tortured for a million years at a maximum intensity, that would sound like way out of proportion, like a million years of torture. To humans, that sounds like that that's got to be too much. But now God says eternity of torture. And it's like, for what? What what did we do? Think of how just non-human this sounds. Like what human would make that up? It's completely unappealing to humans. It's just like, it seems completely unjust. And then you learn, you get that sentence, eternal torture. Not even for anything you did. You get it by default. What human would think of that? What human would say, I'm making up a spiritual system. So the first thing to know is we are all going to pass into an unending eternal state of torture. And it's like, why? What have we done? Every human, no human thinks like, I deserve to be tortured for eternity. And then you learn, but then humans would think, oh, there's got to be some purpose to the torture. Like it makes you believe something or it purifies you. It's like, no, it just goes on for all eternity and you can never escape it no matter what you do. No human would ever, this is like to to our human minds, like that doesn't even make sense. And then get this, it's not even because we did anything like God, but see, God says like, that's what will happen by default, right? But then it's like, well, so how do I not get that? Now, most humans, we'd think, oh, I have to be a good person. I have to like do things not to get that, right? But here's what the, the thing about it. For me, this shows that like the Bible is the work of the supreme spiritual authority God, because no human would ever just conceive of something like that. It's so baffling to us as humans, because we would think that if there is some, you know, prison supposed to reform you, right? So that you get back out and you don't commit crimes again. God's prison isn't like that. You never escape and you fully feel it for eternity. And it's like a state of torture, torment, and it just never ends. And we humans, we think, what purpose does that serve? Why would it be fair to torture someone for eternity, right? But God says, this is what will happen. And then we would think like, well, okay, so how do I not go there? I have to be good. I have to do good things. Then God says, it's no, it's not even about anything you do. You just have to believe something. See humans, we would think, well, can I believe whatever I want? Why is it so consequential what I believe? What humans would think like, well, if you have the wrong belief, you're going to be tortured for eternity. Like, see how that sounds to humans? Just like, how could that be? And that shows that who wrote the Bible is not a human. Any human that was trying to get other humans to believe in their spiritual system would just never come up with that. It's just, it's so beyond what makes sense to us. And that's why God has to make it so clear through so many signs and so much. But then that's that's the amazing thing is God says, hey, you want to not face that? Just believe what I tell you to believe, essentially, right? What is faith but choosing to believe something, right? Like choosing to believe something that we're not convinced by some particular evidence. Like I have faith in that. Really, it's it's like I have faith in something is like saying that like I'm just going to believe that. That's what I believe, right? Like I'm not going to like change it and be convinced of this or that. It's like just picking something to believe, And it comes to us through grace. It's not even like we like rationally look through 
religions and then pick this one or whatever. It's like that moment when you get reborn, it's like even the, the faith itself comes through grace of God. This is stuff that's so not what we would come up with as a human. It's just like, but it, I'm here to tell you today, this is the reality. There is no other. You cannot escape this, but I'm going to believe something else. You know, oh, you can believe something else and you will pay an eternal price for that belief. And by the, you, you might think, well, God would let you taste hell for a while. And then when you're like, I'm sorry, I believe something different now, you, you would get out and he'd be like, now come to heaven. No, it, it doesn't work like that. That is how high the stakes are of this spiritual reality that we're actually in. And that is how deceptive the world is because Satan's the prince of the world and he is doing nothing but hiding this. And like humans might think, well, if I didn't really understand the truth, hey, I'm only human. And God's like, you got to have a strong love of the truth. You don't have to understand much of the truth, but like you got to understand the essence of our whole existence is that we are passing into an eternal state and there is no getting out of it. Like once you're in heaven, you cannot be pulled down. You cannot come back and suffer. And, you know, we, we don't claim to fully understand heaven, but what we can see from the scripture, uh, from people who've been there is like, man, it is just so much better than the earth. You can't imagine it, but you can't choose to stay on the earth. You can't go to a medium place. It's like heaven, hell. That is how the creator of our universe sees everything. There is good. There is evil. They do not merge. You know, Shakespeare says, nothing is good or bad, but thinking make it so. It's like, no, <laughs> God does not believe that whatsoever. Our thinking, our minds, you know, th these days it's as if they have all the power. What you believe, you can achieve. You can create your own reality. You know, hey, if your mind makes it a certain way, then committing evil could be good if your mind makes it so. And that's also what Hinduism completely believes. All the powers in your mind. Guys, that's Satan 101. Satan... It's like gnosis, this concept that there's a secret knowledge. And if you get it, you have all this power. And it's like, guys, God is laughing that to pieces. We don't have that power. But if we seek that power, and as a result, we reject Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the penalty for that is eternal torture. But on the other side, if we accept Jesus' death upon the cross, his blood washes over us and justifies us in the sight of God, which then allows us, first of all, it makes your life way better. It has a huge effect on your earthly life. But the real powerful effect it has is that when this earthly body, when you either die or get raptured, you enter into a place for eternity, which is if hell is like being chained in one place, heaven is like you're moving around, there's freedom. The people in heaven are wonderful evil is like gone and better than anything. God is near you. <laughs> and it's like this being we call God, the father and Jesus Christ and the Holy spirit. They're one. They're also three, man. This God is so great that just being near him is like, <sighs> I've felt it in different ways myself. We felt it in a feeling of love. If you haven't been reborn, I got to say this, you haven't felt it. I hadn't felt it until after I was reborn. What I felt of it, man, is like, you know, you should want to do anything for God. Just give it all to God. Just do anything for God. Because just to have him slightly come near you is like, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. It's just, we are not worthy. That's all I'm saying. We are not worthy of this. We are not. And yet God offers it to us for simply believing something. It's like, that's all you have to do. It's literally, guys, it's the meaning of life. It's the secret of life is to believe on Jesus. Hid amidst everything in life, all the choices we make, all the stuff. It's like God has, wouldn't say hid because it's really obviously at the center of all of our reality, but it seems to be hid if you're looking at the world or other spiritual systems. There's just one choice you have to make. And even that comes from grace, but like you got to make that choice. No matter what you do, no matter anything else, unless you make that one crucial choice, which is not even to do something, it's to believe something. And that is to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and to put your faith in him, believe on him. 
He is the only one who can redeem you. That's what a savior is. We always think stuff is up to our own power, that it's our own thoughts or our own actions or something. And God tells us, no, believe in me. We don't even, it's not about some ritual we do to appease Jesus or go to church every Sunday or something. It's like, no, 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 no. You believe on him. And once you do that, he grants you salvation. It never goes away. It's just the beginning. But whatever we go through in this life until death or the rapture, it's just a twinkling in the eye of eternity. Because when he takes us up with the trumpet or when we die or we pass away, man, all I can say is from what I've seen and experienced it, it makes everything in our life that we suffered more than worth it to a level our minds can't even comprehend. Why? Because God is that great. And we will be learning about God for eternity. He will just always show us more things because he is God. He can do that. He alone can do that. And man, all I can say is we will never get bored of being near God. We will never have any regret of anything we did to serve God. Maybe we do in this earthly life at times, but you know what? Well, we won't up in heaven. And even on this earthly life, the more I do things for God, I do my best to please God, the more you want to please God, because God is so awesome, just so, you know, just amazing, man. Well, our only desire should be to please him. Just from a, a rational standpoint, you, just, you do it, you experience it. It's like he just gives back so much because that's how he is. It's not what we deserve. You know, we give so little to God, but he gives so much back. That's just him, man. And you got to believe on Jesus or everything you know about God is wrong. Hey, you don't even know God at all. I just got to say that. Hey, coming from a man who thought he knew God, coming from a man who did a lot of spiritual works, trying to get close to God, who thought he was, who thought he knew at least some of the truth. Come to find out last October, I didn't know a thing. Now, I, I, I had wisdom of a kind. I learned things. I, you know, hey, the whole demonic delusion wouldn't work if it didn't have that in it. But man, I got reborn. And man, when they say the scales fall from your eyes, wow. That, man, it's, it's all about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will never be able to repay him for eternity. But we will try because it's awesome. And he will just... Keep being revealing even more greatness of himself. And there is only one being in the whole universe who can do that. The being who created the universe, who we call God, who is Jesus Christ. That's his proper name. Yahweh, behold hand, behold nail. Look, a hand, look, a nail. That was, they had that before Jesus walked on the earth. It was prophesied from the first word in the Bible. Man, God is great. <laughs> God is the master artist, the master creator, the one who we should all fall in love with so much. And as you experience God, how can you not fall in love with him? Man, this world is nothing, man. This world is is just, it's sadness. It's just all the pleasures of this world are just nothing, man. Once you get a taste of God, and you know, we're so imperfect. We wander off the track all the time. Even trying our best, we make so many mistakes. You know, I'm unworthy and I know I'll always be, you know, because God is just, wow, I man. All I can say is when I meet Jesus Christ for the first time, I'm going to fall on my face <laughs> out of a mixture of fear, feeling unworthy, because I know I am, we all are, but also out of respect and honor for him. Because he is the great Lord. He is our Redeemer, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is greatness itself. And we should all just be worshiping him and thanking him all the time. You know, in our earthly bodies and our lives, maybe we can't do it every moment. But let's just offer to him just anything we can and, and give it to him. And I know he appreciates it. And then when we get to heaven, man, uh oh, worship mode engaged, we are going to be worshiping him in joy, worshiping him willingly, uh, like the joyous giver. Uh, oh, and it's it's going to go on for eternity. And our minds really cannot comprehend this. Like You can think about it a lot, and it's like we can see a bit of it, but it's like, 
Man, that's how, that's one of the many ways you know the Bible is true. It's because who, who would come up with something like that? It's so against human intuition. It's so against human wisdom. And God says, hey, this is how it is. He wrote it down. <laughs> so many signs throughout time have confirmed it. Everything confirms it. The fact that it prophecies the course of all history confirms it. And for those who don't believe this, it's so sad, but they're going to pay a price of eternal torment for not believing it. And we all have free will and we got to make that choice. And even when you already have salvation, like no doubt many people watching this do, man, let's keep praising our Lord and Savior and just keep giving what we can give to him. Because one of the most beautiful things about him is, even though we are such, I'm going to have to say this, such wretched beings, such beings with so much selfishness. And, and you know, we are, we are not anything like him in the sense of like his greatness, righteousness. What we offer is so tiny. And yet he appreciates it so much because he is that great. We give him the little offerings of whatever we can. And I see this with him. It's like he loves us. He appreciates it. And we should just want to keep offering things to him. Okay, guys. Well, uh, that's, that's pretty much, um, Yep. Oh, yeah, I did it. Uh, I got through the whole uh, sermon. So, guys, I hope that this sermon has helped you. Uh, I hope it's pleased our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone, let's keep watching. Let's keep looking up. And more than anything, man, let's give our whole hearts to God. Because it it is the best choice you will ever make. Uh, and since I've just been doing everything I can to please God, Oh man, if you would ask me back in October, Evan, what's going to happen? And I had picked the best, most exciting plan. Dude, it wouldn't even compare to what's happened. That has been really painful and hard at times, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. All of my spiritual experience and everything I ever had before this all kicked off in October was just nothing compared to this. Things are just falling into place. I'm feeling more peaceful. You know, I still cry at times, but I feel more loved than I've ever felt you know, by, by all you guys, but especially by God and also by, by everyone else, the brethren. And all I can say is that the greatest thing I ever did was just make that choice and believe on Jesus. And even that came through grace. I can't even take credit for that. Oh, man, because man, I'm just leaning on Jesus. I'm learning more and more. He is my strength. He is everything. He is, he is everything. It doesn't have to depend on me or be about me. And thank the Lord for that because I see every day how imperfect I am, how how wretched I am as a creature compared to him. But it's strange, not in a self-hating way, just like that's what it is. I am nothing compared to him. I am filthy rags. You would think that that would make me depressed, but it's actually the opposite. Uh, it's strange. Hey, you got to experience it. You know, come close to God and just give him everything of your heart. Just want to please him. Let that desire, you know, push away your other desires. Now, I don't claim to not have earthly desires. Oh, no, I don't have a glorified body. But more and more, I feel like that desire to please God is slowly helping, you know, it's, it's, it's like as if it heals you. Well, hey, it's the process of sanctification. Uh, anyway, guys, I could go on and on and on. But I hope that this uh, sermon has been helpful to you. Uh, and feel free to write any sort of comment you want and add scripture. Hey, you want to say I'm the false prophet or something? Well, you can do that. Uh, and Or if you'd like to say anything positive, well, do that as well. But hey, free will is yours. Uh, okay, everyone. So let's thank our Lord and Savior and worship and honor him. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the great one. And we love you, Jesus. And thank you, everyone, for uh, for watching the video. Okay, guys, uh, I will see you again soon. Have a great day wherever you are, and may our Lord Jesus Christ continue to bless and protect you. Amen.